listening to Radio Azad, and this is your host, Aisha. And it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Special Agent in Charge of from the Drug Enforcement Administration, Eduardo Chavez, to the show. And uh, we are going to be talking about fentanyl. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for being on the show with us today uh, to talk about this very important uh, issue. Uh, so I understand that you lead the Dallas Field Division uh, overseeing DEA operations in North Texas, and uh, you have been with the DEA since uh, 2000. Right, over uh, 23 years. It's been a long time. <laughs> wow, wow, absolutely. And have you been in Dallas the whole time? No, I've uh, I've kind of traveled all over uh, California. Um, I had some assignments in Mexico City, mm -hmm. uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I've been here since 2017. Okay, and what exactly uh, does uh, somebody who works on uh, the field division do, so if you can just explain that to our listeners? Absolutely. So, so the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, uh, you know, we are the uh, world's largest and I would like to say most successful single mission agency when it comes to investigating uh, drug trafficking organizations, uh, money laundering organizations uh, throughout the world. Uh, we have offices in every state here in the United States uh, to include offices uh, throughout the world, um, you know, from Asia to Central and South America to uh, Europe. Uh, and essentially, you know, our biggest mission is to be able to try and keep uh, a lot of the drugs that are entering our community uh, in particular, and I know we're going to talk about fentanyl, uh, to me, one of the most deadliest threats uh, that has come around uh, in recent years, uh, and hold people accountable, hold a lot of these drug trafficking organizations and these cartel leaders that are just simply uh, gaining a profit, right, making money off of those who might struggle with a drug addiction. Wow. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it really surprised me when I was actually uh, doing my research for this topic that this is such a grave issue and somehow we just don't seem to be hearing enough about it. Um, so I'm so happy that you're going to shed some light uh, on it first. So tell us a little bit, uh, what is fentanyl? And briefly, why is it so concerning to the DEA? What makes it so different from the other drugs that are out there that we keep hearing about, you know, cocaine and heroin and, sure. and uh, the other uh, other opioids? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, you know, so fentanyl in its pharmaceutical form is is a legitimate uh, medication. It's many times used in hospitals. If you've ever been put uh, under anesthesia, uh, chances are you've probably been given fentanyl uh, to put you to sleep for a surgery or some other medical procedure. Uh, sometimes individuals who might be dealing with a, a terminal illness uh, and might be at home uh, might be uh, given fentanyl patches, you know, that is a patch that goes on your skin and it's just uh, absorbed very slowly uh, in the body. Uh, those are all very uh, normal and legitimate and very useful um, ways to use fentanyl. However, uh, most recently what has been happening is illicit laboratories that shouldn't be making it to begin with are producing illicit fentanyl are pressing it into pills that look a lot like uh, some of the medications we might be used to seeing, like Vicodin and Percocet, some painkillers, um, even other drugs that don't match the same sort of symptoms like uh, Xanax or Adderall. Fentanyl in and of itself is an opioid. So mm -hmm. it is a pain reliever. It blocks a lot of the opioid receptors that make the body feel pain or sense pain. So uh, when it is made in an illicit area and people are buying it and selling it and using it on the streets, it becomes very deadly because of the dosage amount. You just need a few grains of fentanyl for it to become deadly. And that is one of the biggest reasons why we are trying to get the, the word out to people to understand, uh, like you said, you know, we've heard of cocaine, we've heard of heroin and methamphetamine in the past, and, and we all know that those are very dangerous drugs, and hopefully we educate our family members about, uh, about them and, and not to risk trying them or experimenting with them. 
With fentanyl, it's very different. With fentanyl, the biggest difference is how small uh, a dosage it takes to actually uh, potentially be overdosed and die. Um, if you take a sugar packet, maybe something that you would use, you know, in, in tea or coffee, usually those, the ones that you find on a restaurant table, those are usually about one gram of sugar. Mm -hmm. If that were actually fentanyl, that could actually kill up to 500 people in just one sugar packet. There's enough, there would be enough fentanyl to kill 500 people. And that's, that's really why we have seen such uh, an increase in overdose and poisoning deaths uh, over the last several years, mm -hmm. because in just a pill, uh, it could have well over that dosage unit. And so sometimes maybe people think I'm going to only take half of it. Uh, it doesn't work that way because it is not a legitimate medication. Mm -hmm. uh, it is made in a drug lab. Uh, but yet it looks like perhaps something we're familiar with, right? Just a, a normal pill. Mm -hmm. That's mind boggling that the the, the uh, analogy that you gave that it, an amount equal to one sugar packet, <clears throat> excuse me, which can kill up to 500 people. That's just, oh. Um, so um, is this going out to our kids? What age group are you seeing who is actually using these drugs? And uh, is, it, is, it, is it boys? Is it girls? Is it middle schoolers, high schoolers, college kids, young adults? What's the age group that you're seeing? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is yes. <laughs> it's, it's all of them. Uh, you know, it is not necessarily marketed toward one particular demographic in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I think historically for a lot of us in our communities, you know, we tend to maybe sometimes view drug abuse um, as somebody else's problem. You know, maybe it's a problem that affects that neighborhood that's over there, right? Mm -hmm. But not our neighborhood or mm -hmm. it's, it's in those other communities, but it's not in our community. It's not in our close family units. It's not with the people that we go to church with or that we see at the grocery store. Um, it tends to be everybody else's problem. Right. With fentanyl, the biggest difference in, is how it is uh, distributed and how it's taken. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's in tablets, it's pills. It's mm -hmm. pills that look very familiar to us. Mm -hmm. I think all of your listeners and, and those watching on Facebook, I think if I were to pull out a few shards of crystal methamphetamine, you know, your eyes might get a little bigger. You might be straining to kind of see what it looks like. Uh, there is that natural, I think, reaction to drugs like this, a white powdery substance of cocaine or a crystal shard of methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. But when somebody has a few handfuls of pills in their pocket, uh, in a baggie, uh, maybe they, it's in a prescription pill bottle with no label, that really doesn't trigger any sort of uh, response of danger or much less anything that potentially could kill you. And I think that's the biggest problem is because we are so used to taking medications. Mm -hmm. I am sure uh, at some point you were taught how to take a pill. You were probably about 10, 11, 12 years old. And somewhere along the line, someone said, OK, you know, these liquid uh, antibiotics or these liquid painkillers, they're just not going to work anymore. You need to, or even a vitamin mm -hmm. you need. You're going to need to learn how to swallow a pill. Yeah. So from a very young age, we've been taught that pills are OK, that mm -hmm. they're meant to make you feel better. So now fast forward to 2023 and this idea of fentanyl. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is studying very hard for an exam and they're you know, they need to cram all night. Mm -hmm. uh, they got that big science test, that big math test. And so maybe one of their friends offers them an Adderall because it'll help keep them awake. And it's from their prescription. At least that's what they tell you. And they tell you, hey, you know what? Just take half because they're really strong. The biggest thing that I think we need to come away from uh, during this time that I have with you is that unless it is a medication that was prescribed to you by your doctor mm -hmm. that you went to the pharmacy to pick up that has your name on it, uh, on the bottle with the dosage units and how much you're supposed to take, 
you can't take a chance that if it doesn't have those things, that the pill somebody is offering you isn't really fentanyl. Currently, right now, on the streets in the Dallas area, six out of 10 pills that are sold on the streets mm -hmm. contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. They contain more than two <clears throat> milligrams. Two milligrams is considered the lethal dose. And so, as I mentioned earlier, that sugar packet, you know, that contains 1,000 milligrams. So if you were to just to take two milligrams out of that, that is considered a deadly dose. And six out of those 10 pills that might be sold in that locker room or in the bathroom at school or even just on the street corner or might be given to you uh, by a friend on your way home, uh, those potentially contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. And, and that is why we just really have to educate uh, our family members, our coworkers, uh, and in particular, our children, mm -hmm. that this is unlike any other drug that we've seen. Absolutely. Um, Special Agent Chavez, tell us a little bit about what kinds of drugs the kids are indulging in these days. So this prescription pills is something new, and I think uh, uh, at least new for, for me as a parent. Sure. Um, but what, what else is out there that the kids are indulging in these days? I think most naturally, one of the first things, and in our experience, in my experience, that almost every person that I have talked to uh, that has either fallen victim to drug abuse or is under arrest because they've kind of transitioned into uh, dealing drugs, almost every single person I've talked to has said they have started with marijuana. They have started uh, either smoking it Mm -hmm. uh, or now very popular is, you know, vaping, you know, with the vape pens and using the liquid uh, THC, which is the, the active ingredient in marijuana that gets you high okay. or even in edibles. You know, uh, you know, when I was growing up and going to school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about the only thing we would ever hear of marijuana getting infused with were brownies. You know, everybody would hear of the, the pot brownies. Yes. Uh, now, uh, they're in gummy gummy bears, they're in popsicles, they're in liquor sticks, they're in suckers, potato chips, uh, candy bars, you know, almost every sort of edible or sweet or savory kind of snack food that you can think of, they can be laced with THC. And in particular with the e-cigarettes and the vape pens, uh, there is a lot of liquid THC that uh, is being used and in a school environment or even in a work environment, one of the biggest challenges is it doesn't smell like traditional marijuana being burned. I think everybody can recognize if you smelt it before, you know that very distinct smell mm -hmm. of marijuana. Mm -hmm. If you're using a vape pen, chances are it probably has a flavoring associated with it. So that vapor that's getting uh, blown out is going to smell like strawberries or watermelon or tutti frutti or something like that. Mm -hmm. Once we've seen that transition, we've talked to a lot of young people who have said, I realized that perhaps it wasn't as bad as everybody said it was. My parents were trying to scare me into not trying these things. So if this isn't as bad, and I seem to be able to still function okay, I can get high and I can still make good grades or I can still make that test or I can still go to sports practice, um, then maybe other things aren't as bad. Then enter something that looks very familiar, mm -hmm. a tablet, a pill. Mm -hmm. And we've seen so many individuals who have opted to try and do that because they've already thought to themselves, uh, the scare tactics that my community, my parents, my teachers tried to uh, put out there with regard to drugs maybe isn't that bad after all. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we've some, seen some very uh, tragic endings to people who thought maybe they were gonna take a painkiller or a Xanax or an Adderall that was given to them by a friend and it turned out to be fentanyl. So this, so they take something like uh, pills for a high. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. They'll, they, and, and you know, it's not like they're taking it much like probably all our doctors told us, you know, uh, take it with a meal or a full glass of water. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of occasions, they're crushing up the pill mm -hmm. and they're either smoking the pill 
or they're just crushing it up and chewing it. Um, that's usually one of the most common methods, you know, so in this particular case, you know, they, they know they are already doing something they shouldn't be doing, or it's a pill that is not being taken like a normal vitamin or a normal, you know, over the counter, uh, headache medication, for example. Right. And so one of the challenges for parents, for communities, for teachers is how small those are, you know, uh, it's just a normal size pill. So, you know, in the palm of my hand, I can fit 30, 40, 50 pills, stick them in my front, front pants pocket, and no one would ever notice. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to take it, you know, even if you just chew it up and swallow it, there's no smell, there's no odor. Uh, it's potentially very easy to hide. Hmm. And how addictive uh, is fentanyl? It is one of the most addictive drugs out there partially just because of how quickly it um, attaches to those opioid receptors to be able to have the person essentially feel no pain, just a very calm uh, calmness to them. I mean, almost, almost like if you were uh, drunk, you know, just a very just kind of relaxed state of mind. But what happens is the body slows down so much mm -hmm. that while the brain is still active, it actually can t forget to tell your lungs to breathe. It can forget to tell you to uh, a lot of uh, fentanyl deaths in particular, they die of asphy asphyxiation and it's because they vomit, but their system is slow, so slowed down mm -hmm. that their body doesn't tell them to turn over, for example. So if they're lying in bed, they throw up and they end up choking because everything is so depressed in their bodies. And that's what fentanyl does. It just gives you really just this really dull sense of your environment. Obviously, that's one of the biggest ingredients that they use to uh, put you under anesthesia. Mm. So it has very much that same effect. And unfortunately, cardiac arrest and respiratory distress are, are one of the biggest uh, factors. School teachers sometimes, parents. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're thinking to ourselves, man, our, our teenagers are always sleepy anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll fall asleep in the car just going from one place to the next, or they can't seem to stay awake in class. Mm -hmm. Well, is it because they stayed up until 2 a.m. playing video games? Or did they take a pill maybe a few minutes before and are actually starting to overdose because of the depressed um, approach to how this drug works? Wow. So do these pills have a street name? And can you tell when you look at the pill that it has been actually laced with something else? So the, again, I, I keep saying one of the most dangerous things, but it, it, I, I can't say that enough only because, again, in my 23 years of doing this, we have never seen such a more deadly drug simply because of how small the amount is to overdose. Mm -hmm. So these pills, uh, one of the more common ones, you know, they're calling them M30s. Mm -hmm. And it's just simply because of the, uh, they're mimicking the uh, Malincrot pharmaceutical company that makes 30 milligram oxycodone pills. So they're a blue green color. They're mm -hmm. stamped with an M on one side with a square around it. And on the other side, they have the number 30. So a lot of times on the street, you know, they might just call them 30s or M30s or we've heard them called baby blues or blue moons because of the coloring. Even some of these other pills that might look like Xanax, you know, the, the rectangle shaped white or yellow colored Xanax that might be prescribed legitimately for anxiety. Mm -hmm. Those are getting uh, replaced with fake pills, you know, that contain fentanyl. Same thing with Adderall or hydrocodone. So to be very clear, legitimate pharmaceutical drugs that are coming from your pharmacy are not getting laced with fentanyl. So if you get them from your pharmacy, there is still that guarantee and that trust that you can have in that closed system of distribution for pharmaceuticals that these street pills are not getting into your legitimate prescription. These are pills that are coming in the same shipments in the same method that meth and cocaine and heroin are coming. It is 100% illicit, black market. And frankly, those pills aren't even laced with fentanyl. They're just 
fentanyl pills looking like if they were something else. Uh, a lot of these pills, you cannot tell the difference. You cannot tell the difference between a real one and a <clears throat> fake one. Mm -hmm. uh, our laboratories have to be the ones that test it to be able to tell what's inside of it. So just by looking at it, you're not gonna be able to tell. The other factors that you should look at are, did this come from a legitimate pharmacy? Why is it not in the pill bottle with somebody's name, with a dosage unit? Uh, who has that original prescription for that particular drug? If you can't answer those questions and it's just a pill maybe that is handed to you, you really have to think twice because chances are it's not what it is and it's actually, in this case, just simply a fentanyl pill. Oh, my goodness. That's very, very scary. Um, but how are these pills actually getting into the hands of our kids? And right. um, that's one question that I have. And, and I understand that some of the kids have, like, these kits to actually test uh, the dosage. So right. tell us a little bit about sure. that as well. Right. So, so a lot of the illicit fentanyl is coming in powder form. A lot of it is being manufactured illegally in China and is making its way primarily to Mexico, also through the internet in pieces, uh, also to the United States, where then most commonly they're getting pressed into these pills. Mm -hmm. But once they get pressed into these pills, uh, it's following the same drug trafficking routes that uh, not only Mexican cartels, but even criminal organizations operating here in the United States will use to get their drugs from point A to point B. Once it gets to a place like the Dallas area, you know, you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, my kid goes to a high school in the suburbs, you know, isn't that drug trafficking at all? Isn't that all in, in the bad parts of town? Yeah. Uh, not true. Uh, and again, in many occasions, what we have heard is when we've asked these people who live in the suburbs, who live in a gated community, who live, you know, with uh, HOA restrictions and in a nice neighborhood, they're saying, where did you find this individual who's willing to sell you pills? Mm -hmm. Usually one of two things. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the same person that helps you get your uh, THC vape liquid, mm -hmm. your, your marijuana edibles, or maybe it's on social media. Maybe you are use, using a lot of those social media platforms that criminal organizations are also using mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to uh, in order to be able to, to to find those individuals and make that transaction. So unfortunately, it's um, not everybody else's problem. It is spread throughout the Dallas area and frankly throughout the country in the nicest neighborhoods and the ones that are maybe uh, struggling you know, from a crime or a socioeconomic standpoint. It's unfortunately a, a equal opportunity killer. Okay. What about social media? So a lot of social media companies are, are really attempting to cooperate with law enforcement to be able to help um, identify these users who pop up, advertise uh, very, sometimes just very blatantly what drugs they have for sale. Uh, but there's always... Uh, a lot of anonymity that comes with these uh, applications. Some, mm -hmm. these applications are based on the idea that you can remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. So with that, unfortunately, comes a degree of uh, criminal element, you know, when they're dealing with it. We've seen these disappearing messages from um, apps like Snap, uh, Instagram, obviously Snapchat, uh, you know, even Facebook Messenger and, and even Apple iMessages where uh, they'll disappear after a short time, uh, you know, so again, for, for me to be able to express to you how to help avoid that, how to identify whether your children or members of your household are maybe going down that road, you know, a lot of it just comes down to having conversations, having conversations with your kids. If chances are, uh, if you've got kids in your household, I would venture to say that you're probably still paying for their cell phone bill. So if that's the case, guess what? You know, you should be able to take a look at their cell phones to be able to identify and look in and see what apps they're using and to talk about it. If you see some sort of communication between somebody who you don't know and the communication back and forth just doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe there's a lot of emojis that are used or just simply conversations that is not 
you know, uh, where are you going to meet after school? Or, you know, how'd you do on that test today? Or, hey, look at that cute boy or that cute girl, you know, where you can tell what they are, then you need to maybe dig in a little deeper and, and have a stronger conversation. Ask questions. A lot of times through all the conversations that I've had, parents are almost afraid to ask those questions because maybe you know what you know, maybe you're already dealing with a little bit of rebellion from your teenager and you don't want to have to get into another fight you've already been fighting with them about schoolwork or after school activities or you know where they're going to go for college and so one more thing you don't want to necessarily bring up drugs because it just seems a little silly everybody knows not to do drugs uh, however in this particular case you have to, you have to ask those questions because it's not like when I was growing up uh, or when a lot of, I'm sure your listeners are growing up to where um, the drugs that were available on the street, um, while dangerous, uh, addictive, could potentially ruin your life, fentanyl was not around, not around the way it is now. And truly one pill can kill you. So one decision uh, can completely have a tragic effect on not only your life, but all those around you. So those conversations have to be had in the home. Mm, very, very important. And I think a little later on, I'm going to just explore that a little further. Sure. I want to ask you, um, what are the signs to look for if your child is using fentanyl? Um, so you talked a little bit about the, you know, depressed body functions, but what, what else is there? What are some of the cues that you can tell if your child is a user? Well, when I spoke to a lot of parents, uh, unfortunately, parents who, who have, who realized it uh, too late, you know, and, and have had tragedy strike their lives through a, a child who, who has passed because of that. When they start looking back and they start trying to peel apart some of the signs that they used to see, a lot of it was simply they, they'd spend a lot more time in their room. You know, the, the behavior changed, right? They weren't uh, the, I, I heard one mom say, you know, she just wasn't the same kid anymore. She was always, she was a little bit edgier. Um, she had friends coming by the house that I didn't recognize uh, or didn't know who they were. Um, her grades were fine, but she just kind of seemed disconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, in another occasion, a father said, you know what, all of a sudden he picked up smoking, mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes. And that was just kind of weird. He had never done that before, you know, and so I, I kind of fought him on it. But at the same time, it wasn't worth fighting because in my mind, he said, uh, they just grow out of it. And so I wasn't willing to just take that on too early. Mm -hmm. um, in other occasions, people sometimes are so concerned about maybe drinking. And I had one, uh, one parent tell me that they were so concerned that their kids would go out and get drunk, that they were really trying to pay attention to that because they didn't want to have them get a DUI and get arrested. But then they missed the whole idea that they started to smoke weed. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, one thing led to another. Um, you know, a lot of the secretiveness when it comes to their phone and it, do they run out real quick to meet a friend, you know, and they're in and out. Uh, also just what's in their room. You know, uh, you know, if you're going in there to, to drop off some clean clothes or to pick up dirty laundry or maybe help them clean their room, you know, are they, you know, sort of secretive about certain things? You know, it's almost when, when you're doing something wrong and someone walks in, you know, you kind of have that shock factor, like, oh, you know, and you try and pretend you're doing something else. Mm -hmm. That should be a clue for a lot of us to dig a little deeper to see what that's about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about somebody who has maybe taken an overdose? What are some of the symptoms um, to look for? And then if you can tell us if there is anything we can do, is it reversible? What should a parent sure. do? So 100%, you know, if you feel something is just not right with your child, your spouse, your brother, your sister, uh, you know, first, one of the things is just responsiveness. You know, even, even somebody who's been up for a long time, you'll be able to still get them to respond, even temporarily, if they're just so sleepy, you know, or you woke them up and they're still a little groggy. 
-hmm. you know, if you're starting to overdose on an opioid, that is just, you're just going to be unable to wake them up to where they can even open their eyes. Um, the other thing would actually be to open their eyes, check their pupils, right? You know, how are their pupils looking? Are they a normal size or are they not? You know, and sometimes uh, those already start to turn blue simply because they're just not getting enough oxygen because their, their brain is almost forgetting their lungs uh, to breathe in the same way. Their mm -hmm. skin is clammy. First and foremost, one of the biggest things is call 911 to call emergency services, to be able to get them uh, in route, to be able to start attending to them. Don't wait. Uh, you're not going to get in trouble. If you're a kid and you guys are both messing around and you see one of your friends potentially start to overdose, you're not going to get in near the amount of trouble by calling 911 versus just letting your friend potentially die. Yeah. There is a drug out there. Um, perhaps a lot of people have heard of it. It's called Narcan, mm -hmm. uh, N-A-R-C-A-N. That is an opioid reversing drug. Narcan is, um, was originally actually meant to reverse the effects of heroin. Uh, but because fentanyl is actually 50 times more potent than heroin, mm -hmm. uh, what you'll see is it might take several doses. Uh, Narcan, uh, they just passed a law here where it'll be available over the counter. It mm -hmm. comes in what looks like a little inhaler uh, pouch. It's, you know, you stick it up into your nose and you squirt it and it essentially instantly reverses some of the effects of fentanyl where people will wake up. Mm. It is 100% a, a life-saving drug. Um, the best part about it is, is you can't screw it up. Uh, I urge all households to be able to have at least, you know, some Narcan in their home for that exact reason, because just when you think it's not going to happen to you, you mm -hmm. want to be able to have it available just in case. Uh, ambulance and emergency service personnel, they carry that. Police officers carry that. Um, the biggest thing is there are no side effects. There's no contraindications with other drugs. The biggest thing there is it reverses the effects of an opioid and gets people awake and breathing again. You may need more than one, uh, and we've heard of people getting uh, multiple dosages of Narcan. I think the most I've heard of one, uh, one person was 13 times. Ooh. Because what would happen is you give them the Narcan, mm -hmm. and then within a few minutes, they start to overdose again because the Narcan wears off. Mm. And so then you have to hit them again. That is something that I think is very important. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a life-saving uh, drug that everybody should be familiar with and not be afraid to use it. Mm -hmm. There's been Narcan administered sometimes and the people were actually drunk, <laughs> not realizing they were drunk, but they thought they were perhaps overdosing from an opioid. Okay. And there's no uh, negative consequence to that. Got it. Okay, so over the counter and uh, has to be in every household. Uh, that's great information. Um, what about somebody who may be a user? What can they do to break the habit? Do they have to go into rehab or what's the protocol for that? Yeah, you know, so so for the DEA, you know, we focus, uh, our primary mission is focusing on the, the enforcement uh, mm -hmm. of drug laws and identifying and being able to investigate a lot of those who are trafficking the drugs. We've partnered with multiple organizations and on our website, dea.gov, you can find a lot of links towards some prevention and some resource information that is very applicable to not only parents, but sometimes caregivers uh, or teachers or even organizations that are wanting to try and start up, whether it's a church or a community organization, try and start up some degree of uh, prevention and education. We have curriculum that is completely free if people just don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. you know, if you are somebody who is struggling with, with addiction, uh, that might be a good place to start to be able to find resources to be able to help. There are a lot of um, in, in and outpatient services throughout DFW uh, because the biggest idea is, is just trying to get help. Mm -hmm. Talk to your parents, talk to your family members, talk to somebody you know, who you care about, maybe even at school or uh, you know, in, your, in your church or wherever, where you can say, look, I've got a problem. I can no longer control it. I don't think I ever could control it, 
And so now I need to try and get help. I think that acknowledgement is probably one of the biggest and most important steps into trying and finding help only because there's no such thing as experimentation with fentanyl. So if you've never tried it before and you just want to try it because you're curious to see how it feels, you cannot take that chance. Mm -hmm. Equally, if you've been struggling with substance abuse for a while and you've tried some other drugs, maybe you're a regular user of marijuana and this is something that is attractive to you or you're, you're curious about, and maybe you have taken some and you've been able to get away with that Russian roulette of risking your life with that pill. Um, you can't just assume because you've taken it once, maybe twice, that that next time won't be your last. So very important to be able to talk about it and uh, very easily, uh, you know, a couple quick internet searches. And I'm sure there's, you know, all kinds of resources that will be able to pop up. You can start with DEA.gov. Our one pill can kill campaign mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of useful information as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I looked at that. So it's very good resources. Do uh, Does the DEA actually go out and work with schools and with places of worship to try and educate uh, parents and kids? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, on a lot of occasions, we received a lot of uh, requests to come and do presentations to parent groups to talk. We're happy to do that. We always try and partner with, you know, the local police department and sometimes some organizations that are in the the prevention business, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the the uh, the idea of drug abuse in this country, it's uh, a multi uh, faceted approach to try and attack. You mm -hmm. know, on one hand, it's education and prevention. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's treatment and the ability to get people better, those who have already struggled with that addiction. And then on our end, you know, a lot of it is the enforcement, the enforcement side of, of criminal organizations who are trying to peddle these drugs in our community, uh, half the time don't even use drugs themselves. They're, they see themselves as businessmen and women. Uh, and so in that particular case, it's, you know, our primary job to be able to enforce those laws and hopefully, you know, give them very stiff criminal pe penalties while the organizations, the educational institutions can help maybe prevent others. And maybe those who are already struggling, those treatment centers can help get them better. So we're happy to partner with all of those uh, areas. And again, you know, through our website, through our public information officer, uh, we can help navigate those things to see, do we visit, visit a place of worship and provide a, a fentanyl presentation? Do we uh, partner with perhaps a local police department, you mm -hmm. know, and provide them with things as well? So there's a lot of opportunities out there. They just have to ask. Okay, that's very good to know. And the, the question that I want to come back to is how do you talk to your kids uh, about drugs? And one thing that you mentioned is, you know, that sweet and savory things are laced with, uh, you know, marijuana or a lot of other uh, things. Now, you know, a lot of us have kids going on to college, their parties, uh, there's a punch bowl, there's potato chips like that. Right. What do you talk to your kids? Should they go and not just eat or drink anything? I mean, what? tell us a little bit about uh, how should we navigate this? Sure. So a lot of times for drug trafficking organizations to be successful, they need to make money. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the idea of just offering, you know, this, this big bowl of chips that might be laced with some other drugs, that's not helping these organizations make money especially if anyone can just go and grab some. Um, there's a lot of times, usually what happens is most people know, most people know that there's something a little different about this and they're wanting to sell it. And it's not just that bowl of potato chips or pretzels or, or anything like that. To me, I think, you know, obviously knowing where you're going and, and the environment you're in, uh, you should be able to, to kind of key on some of those things that just don't make sense. Uh, you know, the, the bowl of peanuts, right? You know, I mean, but, you know, like many, uh, you know, many of us who have uh, young children or in particular daughters uh, who have gone out to these, you know, clubs and bars and they're starting to go out to different parties in high school and in college. 
you know, I'm sure uh, we've all had that conversation about the drinks and watching where they leave their drink, you know, and to make sure nothing, you know, somebody doesn't pour something into their drink, right? It's very similar in this sense. It's the idea of unless you know where it's coming from, uh, you can't take a chance, you know. So uh, where, where we've seen, uh, we, we've had parents ask us, well, you know, how do I know the, the packet of candy that is being given to my son from another kid isn't laced with something. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one is that packet of candy sealed and, and is it just very normal here? You know, you want, you want some Skittles, for example, or is it already in that conversation of, hey, you should try these. These, these are gonna make you feel funny. These are gonna be strong, be careful with them. You know, does it come already with a little extra uh, extra caution. Um, you know, unfortunately, you just can't tell. You know, even my family, uh, you know, where where we have kids that are going into middle and high school and things like that to where, you know, even something sharing gum, you know, is it coming from the, you know, the gum, uh, the gum packet or bottle and it looks like it's from that and it looks the same and, and there's really no extra um, wink and a nod like, hey, be careful with these or, hey, try these before you go to PE, you know, you're going to feel great. You know, usually there's extra language associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously even more so if they're saying, hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be a, a huge red flag. Flag. Mm -hmm. All right. You've given such amazing information and eye-opening information to keep, uh, you know, ourselves, our kids, our families safe, uh, Special Agent uh, Chavez. I really want to thank you. Sure. Uh, anything else that you feel is important for our community to know? I think overall, I don't want to have to talk to more parents who said we had no idea. We had no idea. We never thought our child would be doing this. Once you start having a deeper conversation, that's when they start to realize, I saw this a few weeks ago, or I even saw this a few months ago, but because we didn't want to be that family, because I think there is a stigma sometimes that is associated with somebody uh, who has a family member struggling with uh, substance abuse mm -hmm. because they didn't want to be that family uh, they just avoided the problem avoided talking about it I much rather have you be that family that has a child that is struggling with substance abuse that you're trying to get help versus a family who has already lost their child and are now grieving and are now speaking out on how to avoid it have uh, other families avoid that same situation it just simply comes down to sitting down as awkward or as uncomfortable as it might be and saying, we're going to talk about drugs. We're going to talk about fentanyl. Tell me, you know, son, daughter, you know, tell me what's at school. What have you heard? Who uses drugs at your school? Have you seen drugs? You might be surprised at their answers, but you have to then be okay with their answers because maybe they're going to tell you that they have tried it. So then at least there you can start that conversation to try and get them uh, on the right path or try and get them some help. Uh, so I guess to me, it all comes down to having a conversation, not being afraid of the answers that you might hear and being able to then navigate through it, you know, to be able to come up with what hopefully is, is a good resolution. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate uh, the time um, and uh, your wonderful, wonderful knowledge and expertise. And I'm hoping that the worst is behind us and, and we can, uh, you know, uh, get these, our, our neighborhoods cleaned up. That's right. That's right. Thank you very much for having us. I appreciate you, uh, you bringing on the DEA to be able to talk about that very important subject for us. So we appreciate all you and your listeners time. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.